Front cover. The Madonna and Child with two female saints. Oil on panel, circa 1500. By Master of the Cortona Tondo. The beloved image of the Virgin and Child held a privileged and popular place in the everyday lives of Renaissance people. The anonymous artist portrays the youthful mother and her child in the company of two female saints. Fine brushwork draws our gaze to delicate details of dress. Items like the veils worn as headgear by the female saints appear to float transparently against a dark, neutral background. Attention directed to the Christ child by the gaze of the other three figures leads the viewer's eye to his precocious actions. Mary's lap supports a playful Christ, who reaches out to grab her veil and mantle. The touchingly childish gesture registers a warmth and humanity that evokes a mood of tender intimacy. In a theme dear to the Renaissance, the natural warmth depicted in the exchange between the child and his mother strikes a note that may seem to us more domestic than divine. In her right hand, the Virgin holds what is probably a pomegranate, a symbol of the resurrection. The serenity of the idealized faces offers a fitting entry into the main themes of Renaissance spirituality. The humanity of Christ, intimacy between mother and child, and closeness to us, the viewers. January, the presentation of Christ in the temple, fresco, circa 1305 to 1309, by Giotto di Bondone. Giotto grips our attention in this portrayal of Simeon, reaching out to hold the infant Jesus in his veiled hands. This detail, from the great Florentine master's fresco of the narrative traditionally known as the presentation of Christ in the temple, invites us to imagine this story through the eyes of the devout old man. Luke recounts how it had been revealed to Simeon, an old man of the temple, that he would not die before he had seen the Messiah. Simeon gazes reverently upon the Christ child. As Simeon says, he may depart in peace now that his longing to see the Messiah has been fulfilled. Christ in contrast, appears unsettled, his attention divided as he reaches out with his right arm for the protecting presence of his mother. Mary is missing from the detail. Christ's searching gesture evokes every newborn's vulnerability. Even so, the child's gaze remains fixed upon the old man. In the visual power of the exchange between the two figures, Giotto transforms the moment into a profound spiritual revelation as one life begins and another is ending. The narrow space that separates the two heightens the contrast between the venerable old man and the innocent child. We recall Simeon's prophecy that her child would cause Mary to suffer as if a sword had pierced her heart. Like Giotto's 14th century audience, we find our own contemplation of this moment tinged with love and fear for the future of this child and his family. February, the birth of the Virgin, fresco 1516 to 1521 by Bernardino Luini. The Milanese artist and follower of Leonardo da Vinci invests this domestic scene with typical North Italian earthy realism. The detail depicts the midwives busily preparing Mary's birth. Midwives performed a vital role in late medieval life. Their skillful care and support of both the mother and the newborn was vital, at a time when mortality rates were high for both mother and child. The older woman at left extends her arm towards the basin lying just out of sight of the detail reproduced. Meanwhile, the younger woman, at opposite, pours water from the heavy metal ewer into the Virgin's first bath. 
Mary, surprisingly alert for a newborn, turns as if distracted by the younger woman grappling with the heavy vessel. Behind these figures in the foreground, glimpses of domestic utensils, including metal pitchers, chargers and bowls, remind us that often these items served a utilitarian and a symbolic function. Bowls might hold nourishing chicken soup for the exhausted mother. On a less practical note, expensive objects like the metal ewers were given as gifts to celebrate the birth of a child. The fresco of the birth of the Virgin originally decorated a chapel dedicated to St. Joseph in the Milanese church of Santa Maria della Pace. Although some 500 years separates us today from the original viewers of the fresco, through Luini's artistry, we can glimpse the profound paradox at the heart of the imagery of giving birth. The midwife's presence remind us that often the most practical of acts are intimately connected to the most sacred moments of our lives. New life in all its forms, whether real or symbolic, benefits from wise and practical guides and comforters. March, The Last Supper, Fresco 1480, by Domenico Ghilandaio, Domenico Bigodi. Paintings of the Last Supper are amongst the most frequent scenes depicted in Western art. This is not surprising. The dramatic scene in which Christ's betrayer, Judas, reveals himself in the midst of a meal shared with the apostles, opens the Passion narrative. Depictions of the story feature especially in Italian art of the Renaissance. In Florence, a tradition developed where religious communities of women and men commissioned artists to locate the scene of the Last Supper on the refectory wall. Ghilandaio's The Last Supper, painted for the refectory of the Monastery of the Onesanti, situates the scene in a room where we must imagine the table stretching across the dining space. At the short ends of the table, as we see in this detail, a single figure closes the composition. Ghilandaio, renowned for his lively figures, invests this scene of a shared meal with fine, descriptive passages of everyday life. The apostles, as we see in this detail, react to the moment of betrayal, which is not included in the detail, with a variety of well-observed actions. Gestures intended to individuate each apostle's reaction to the words of betrayal signal to the viewer a range of emotions. The youthful apostle at the left places a hand in a respectful gesture on the arm of his much older companion beside him. This action juxtaposes the old man's confusion with the younger man's dawning understanding. The third apostle reacts decisively to the drama. His body pivots away from his companions at left. We read in his abrupt movement the horror felt by a good man as he recoils from betrayal. Gilandayo's figures inhabit a world drawn from daily life. Through the apostles frescoed before us, Gilandayo invites the viewer to imaginatively become one with Christ at his table. April, Christ Rising from His Tomb, Fresco, circa 1438 to 1445, by Fra Angelico, Guido di Pietro. Fra Angelico's spiritual and artistic legacy continues to draw admirers to his works, particularly those in Florence. The former Dominican friary of San Marco contains many of the master's most treasured works which transformed the friars' living quarters into spiritual sanctuaries. Amongst the most famous of his frescoes are the series painted for each of the cells occupied by individual friars. Within these rooms, whether in study, prayer or sleep, the friar spent a good deal of his time. Inside each sparsely appointed cell, Fra Angelico's fresco dominated the tiny interior space. In cell 26, the compelling scene of Christ rising from his tomb overwhelms the viewer. Life-size figures of Christ 
accompanied by the Virgin and St. Thomas Aquinas, appear to have materialized before the viewer. The starkly realistic depiction of Christ as the man of sorrows invokes a revered visual tradition. Here, Christ's wounds recall his passion and death. However, by portraying Christ standing unsupported in the tomb, Fra Angelico visually conflates Christ's death and his resurrection. In contrast to narrative images of the crucifixion, Fra Angelico explores the timeless, devotional meaning of Christ's suffering. Episodes from the Passion narrative leap out against the impenetrable black background. Devoid of a narrative context, the seemingly random scenes stir the viewer's compassionate gaze. Each discrete fragment recalls imagery familiar from late medieval devotions and prayers. As in them, moments like Judas's betrayal, Peter's denial, or the soldier's torment heightened the reader's compassionate response to Christ's suffering. Fra Angelico's profound visual meditation on Christ's humanity invites modern-day pilgrims to gaze contemplatively before the miracle of the Incarnation. May, Joan of Arc, Oil on Panel, 1882, by Dante Gabriel Charles Rossetti. The English artist Dante Gabriel Rossetti painted this work in the final days of his life. Rossetti captures Joan of Arc, the subject of this visually sumptuous painting, in a moment of introspection. Rossetti had earlier painted several versions of the valiant peasant girl. In his last work, the artist depicts the courageous young woman about to kiss the tightly gripped hilt of her sword. Through this action, she speaks her vow to God to defeat the English army during the conflicts of the late 1400s. As she lifts her gaze heavenward, Joan's fierce determination finds expression in her resolute pose. Rossetti, renowned for his series of paintings of famous women, casts Joan as a decidedly romantic heroine. The warmth of her creamy complexion, together with the cascade of Titian red hair, artfully contrasts with the cold reflection from her sword and armor. Rossetti's sympathetic interpretation of what his inscription calls Gion la Pucelle, Joan the Maid, emerged against the background of French campaigns to canonize her. Pope Benedict XV did just that in 1920, following France's miraculous escape from defeat in World War I. This enigmatic female warrior saint fits perfectly into Rossetti's obsession with medieval history and romance. June. Christ appears to apostles behind closed doors, 1308 to 1311, by Duccio dai Buoninsegna. The commanding presence of Christ, portrayed standing at the center of this scene, calls out to the viewer. Duccio, the great Sienese master and contemporary of the Florentine Giotto, painted this panel as part of an extraordinary multi-panelled altarpiece, which originally decorated the high altar of Siena Cathedral. The unusual double-sided altarpiece featured scenes from the lives of Christ and the Virgin. The panel once formed part of the narrative of Christ's life, inserted into the rear-facing scenes portraying episodes from Christ's ministry, passion and resurrection. Today, the Maestra, as the reconstituted masterpiece is now known, resides in the museum of the Diomo Cathedral. Duccio reveals the profound influence of Byzantine artistic tradition in his art. Symmetry plays a vital role in creating a harmonious, yet paradoxically dramatically expressive drama. We note how architecture reinforces the divine authority of Christ's appearance amongst his followers. The apostles huddle together. Their timid, cramped gestures and anxious expressions convey amazement and fear. Christ, meanwhile, 
stands apart from the men on either side of him. Colour, as in all of Duccio's oeuvre, recalls the influence of Byzantine artistic tradition. The apostles typically appear in colours of a cooler tonality. With the exception of St. Peter's lime green cloak at Christ's right, the other apostles appear in more subdued colours. Against the more decorative palette of the apostles' robes, Christ's illuminating presence evokes his dual nature. Duccio inherits from Byzantine convention the visual motif of gold as a symbol of the divine realm. Following this centuries-old tradition, the artist employs gold leaf, finely applied in a pattern of abstract striations over the surface of Christ's tunic and mantle. The original viewers of Duccio's majestic altarpiece must surely have looked at this master's profoundly compelling narrative of Christ's redemptive ministry with admiration and gratitude. No other artist of his time rivaled Duccio's sublime gift for translating the mystery of God's promise into a visual language accessible to all humanity. July, The Dream of Elijah, Oil on Canvas, 1650 to 1655, by Philippe de Chapignat. The Flemish-born Philippe de Chapignat achieved success as an artist at the French court. The Queen Mother, Marie de Medici, and Cardinal Richelieu numbered among his powerful patrons. The artist's reputation rests on his portraits and religious paintings, like this oil on canvas of the dream of Elijah. The artist locates Elijah, the Old Testament prophet, in a serene landscape. The episode portrayed recalls Elijah's flight into the desert in order to escape the wrathful punishment of the prophet's enemy, Queen Jezebel. As he sleeps, exhausted by his journey and ready to die, an angel appears to him twice. In this finely balanced composition, Philippe de Chopinier's classically inspired angel elegantly rises above Elijah, sprawled across the ground. Light that appears to fall from above highlights the angel's commanding gestures. The angel's arms extend out in several directions over Elijah's motionless figure. On our right, we note the bread and carafe of wine, which rest beside Elijah's head. The angel's emphatic gesture highlights the life-giving food and drink. The placement of these symbolically charged objects reminds the viewer and us of the miracle of bread and wine in the Eucharist. Expressive visual devices, like the eye-catching pink drapery, lead the viewer's eye from the Eucharistic symbols at right. Our gaze finally rests on the heavenly messenger's eloquent commanding finger pointed towards the distant image of Mount Horeb. Here, on this Mount of God, we know from Scripture how Elijah, fortified in food and wine, will rest for forty days and nights. Contemporary viewers, familiar with the convention of speaking gestures, familiar to them from sermons and theatrical performances, must have admired the artist's classically inspired deployment of such visual devices. August, the Assumption of the Virgin and the Saints Julian and Miniato, 1449-1450, Reproduction Reverses Original Direction, by Andrea del Castagno. Although the scriptures do not relate the details surrounding Mary's final days, the tradition that Christ's mother was assumed bodily into heaven dates to the early Christian era. The miraculous event, known as the Assumption of the Virgin, features in Italian art from at least the 14th century. Often, as we see here, the scene includes saints, in this case, Saint Miniato at the viewer's left and Julian at right as timeless witnesses. Painted for a church, since destroyed, Castagno portrays this miraculous event, employing pictorial conventions familiar to the artist's contemporaries. Mary appears enclosed 
in an almond-shaped frame. Symbolically, this shape was first associated with Christ. However, the mandola, as it's called, gradually extended to include the Virgin at the Assumption. The flame-coloured clouds within this giant halo-like shape suggest the Virgin's departure from her earthly life. The space-denying gold background we glimpse behind the Virgin and the two saints accompanying her remind the devout viewer of the belief in the mystery of Mary's assumption into heaven. The Virgin leads the viewer's gaze heavenward, while her expansive figure, emphasized by the pyramidal blue cloak, extends expansively in space around her with a fluid movement. The Virgin lifts her face to where we imagine Christ waits to welcome her. The painter invites the viewer to feel swept up in the mystery of human flesh, being absorbed into God's radically transforming divine love. September, the three archangels and Tobias, tempera on panel, circa 1460 to 1470, by Domenico di Michelino. The unknown patron of Domenico di Michelino's painting, The Three Archangels and Tobias, like his contemporaries, sought comfort in stories from scripture, the lives of the saints, and most popular of all, images of Christ and his mother the Virgin. 15th century viewers identified the angels and other divine beings by means of their attributes, that is, the symbols associated with them. Thus, Michael appears at left in armour. The scales hanging from his left arm remind us of his role as weigher of souls at the Last Judgment. Next to the warrior angel, Raphael can be recognised by the container and instrument he holds prominently in his right hand. Tobias, the youth depicted with one hand trustingly resting in Raphael's hand, carries a large fish in the other hand. Thanks to the presence of the fish, devout viewers identified this archangel and his companion from the Old Testament story of Tobit. The popular tale narrates how the young Tobias overcomes obstacles as he and his heavenly guardian Raphael set out to discover a cure for his father Tobit's blindness. Tobias and Raphael ultimately return successful, for Tobias returns with a cure for his father as well as a wife. Amongst the archangels, Gabriel's role in the cosmic drama of humanity's salvation evokes most dramatically the meaning of these divine messengers in human history. Gabriel carries the lily, symbol of Mary's faithful acceptance of God's astounding invitation to a simple peasant girl. These angelic mediators between earth and heaven remind us of our own encounters with messengers of God's presence in our lives. October, A Miracle of St. Sylvester, Oil on Panel, 1450s, by Francesco di Stefano Pesellino. This charming painting depicts a legendary story from the life of St. Sylvester, Pope from 314 to 335. Tradition holds that it was this Pope who baptized the Emperor Constantine, this small panel originally formed part of the lower section of an altarpiece. Our painting and two other works featured scenes from the life of St. Sylvester. In this story, we learn how the Pope, seen kneeling at left, miraculously brings an ox back to life. Through this healing act, the Pope defeated a magician in a contest before the Emperor and his mother Helena, whom we recognize as the crowned woman seated at right. The figure of the Emperor Constantine at the far left, opposite his mother, has been omitted from this reproduction. Pesellino locates the story in a space that features the classically inspired architectural style of the early Renaissance. Figures appear to move and occupy space according to the laws of perspective. Pesellino achieves the illusion of depth by showing the grey tiles on the floor appearing to gradually recede. Within this airy, evenly lit loggia, the central characters respond to the events with restrained elegance. 
the group of young men standing at the left, wear expensive dress, typical of wealthy Florentines at this time. The magician, identified by his extravagant red hat and pink mantle, registers dismay at the animal's return to life. His gestures signal both shock and uncertainty. Others, like the learned older man seated next to the Empress Helena, express amazement. However, as the Empress Helena lifts her hand to her breast, this symbolic gesture signals to the viewer the deeper meaning of this story. She alone acknowledges in her reaction to Pope Sylvester's prayer, acceptance and conversion. November, giving of the keys to St. Peter from the Sistine Chapel, fresco 1481, by Pietro Perugino. When the Umbrian-born artist Perugino received the commission for this fresco of the giving of the keys to St. Peter, he joined a number of other Italian artists in a prestigious project. The chapel, now known as the Sistine Chapel, takes its name from Pope Sixtus IV. In 1477, the Pope ordered the building and decoration of the chapel within the complex of buildings known as the Vatican Palace. The story recounted in St. Matthew's Gospel symbolized, above all, the authority and prestige of the seat of St. Peter, Bishop of Rome, and first Pope. Perugino invests the episode with a sober dignity and grandeur. According to ancient tradition, the keys symbolized the power given to St. Peter to forgive sins. The influence of classically inspired artistic ideals of clarity and symmetry find a near-perfect formulation in Perugino's composition. In the background, buildings inspired by antiquity establish a visual sense of grandeur and symmetry. Similarly, the orderly arrangement of Christ and the Apostles across the foreground of the picture plane enhances a mood of measured calm. Christ and St. Peter literally take center stage in their meeting. Christ stands apart from the other figures. His separation from the Apostles reminds the viewer of Christ's divine authority. St. Peter responds to Christ's commission by falling to his knees the familiar pose associated with humility. Equally revealing is the gesture the saint makes as he brings his hand to his chest. The action recalls the saint's claim of his unworthiness for such a mission. Indeed, by focusing the viewer's gaze on the key falling between the two protagonists, Perugino reminds the viewer of the awesome responsibility such a commission demands. December, the Adoration of the Shepherds, Oil on Canvas, circa 1650, by Bartolome Esteban Murillo. The Spanish artist Murillo evokes a mood of tender reverence in his rendering of this familiar episode from the infancy narrative. The story, only found in Luke, describes an angel announcing Christ's birth to a group of shepherds. The painting depicts the scene where the shepherds present their humble gifts to the Christ child. The gifts they bring, a lamb and basketful of eggs, remind the viewer of the shepherd's lowly status. Despite their poverty and meager resources, the generosity of their gifts speaks to the viewer of the shepherd's love for the Christ child. Murillo underlines the meagerness of these peasants' lives, yet, the artist conveys the patient attentiveness of the shepherds. Like the Italian artist Caravaggio some 40 years before him, the Spanish painter discovers dignity in the earthly humanity of the muted colours and homespun drabness of the shepherds' costumes. The careworn faces of the older man and woman hint at the daily struggle to survive. The young man gently restrains the lamb with a gesture that reassures the nervous animal. Light bursts into the darkened space, seemingly from a space outside the painting. Like a spotlight suddenly erupting amid the darkness, 
This brightness illuminates the child with Mary, his mother. Joseph stands quietly, gazing down upon his child. Through Murillo's mastery, the viewer finds themselves ushered into the mystery of the Word made flesh who dwells among us.